So good afternoon or good evening, good morning, everyone. Um, this is Vinay. Uh, so let me quickly introduce and then I'll shut up the video again to save everyone's bandwidth. Uh, so thanks for taking time today. Uh, my name is Vinay and uh, I'm the CEO and founder for Aya.ai. Uh, we are building the vertical AI cloud for BFSI industry. Um, that being said, let me uh, deep dive into the topic today and uh, take you through that. Um, so. I'll take you through the deck and uh, maybe a little bit of case study is as well. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. Uh, please use chat for asking any questions. Um, I may, depending on the timing, I may answer it immediately or uh, I may answer it at the end of the conversation. Yeah, great. So let me share my screen. Yeah, hope everyone can see my screen. Yes, great. Uh, good evening, guys. Uh, so today, uh, the topic that I will be uh, uh, presenting is about using ML observability uh, and designing uh, AI governance using uh, ML observability. Uh, I think of all uh, of late, uh, there have been a tremendous demand to use AI ML, right? Uh, everybody wants to uh, improve or enhance their system performance, uh, either through automation or augmentation or use uh, intelligent alternatives uh, for many of these use cases. Uh, while there is a tremendous amount of focus on manufacturing models or AIML models as we call it as, uh, now uh, uh, there is a parallel focus around uh, 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 safe AI, right? Or auditable AI or responsible AI as we call it as. Uh, in the recent few months, there has been tremendous uh, buzz around uh, you know, generative AI like uh, ChatGPT or stable diffusion, uh, those kind of models. Uh, but now increasingly there have been a ton of case studies on how people have leveraged or utilized it to create something wrong, which it was not meant to or jailbreak the system kind of stuff. So this is just a small example of a larger problem that we are going to see. Uh, so that's where uh, uh, ML observability can help uh, the stakeholders. Uh, ML observability is a, a separate layer that works in parallel or along with the ML ops uh, uh, layer. So for example, if MLOps is focusing on all things related to ML, uh, ML observability primarily focuses around uh, model governance or model explainability or model auditability. So we'll go into the details about uh, why it is required or how it can be implemented in the today's scenario. So this is a primary agenda for today's conversation. So we'll, uh, we'll discuss about why ML observability is required. And next is uh, we'll talk about what are the different components that you would require in an ML observability framework. Uh, these components are, are explainability component, monitoring component, auditing component, or uh, model usage uh, risk monitoring. Uh, so before we start, uh, you know, if you look at uh, deploying AI in uh, high risk use cases or sensitive use cases, as we call it as, uh, so these are the use cases which are primarily in uh, uh, financial services or banking or insurance or uh, healthcare or manufacturing, for example. So those use cases are categorized as high risk use cases or sensitive use cases, or even mission critical use cases, right? So whenever you are deploying AI in such use cases, uh, so there is, uh, uh, yeah. So whenever there are such uh, high sensitive use cases, uh, then there is an expectation from the AI solution, right? Uh, one is, uh, first expectation is it should be transparent. Meaning, let's say I'm using this AI for my uh, healthcare. I, did, I, I do not want a block, uh, black box model uh, giving me recommendations around diagnosis, right? Or I do not want a black box system to decide my underwriting transactions. So it has to be transparent. That is intrinsically an expectation if you are looking to use AI in uh, uh, high risk cases. Second is bounded risk. What it means is, um, you know, okay, fine. So I'm using AI in my process, but as a business owner or as the head of the business, I need to know what are the risks of using this model. So it is it is parallel to using any software, right? Uh, meaning if I give you a software, if I do not tell you what is the risk of using that software, uh, you may not be comfortably using that software to its full potential. So that's what is happening with AI today as well. While AI has potential, but uh, if you do not give a guarantee of what is the risk of using this model uh, with a bounded risk probability, uh, then uh, people will again may not have confidence to use it at a full potential as well, uh, particularly in uh, high risk use cases. Uh, third is promised SLAs. Uh, what it means is, okay, you deployed the AI for a use case. Uh, you cannot uh, promise, uh, uh, you know, overly during uh, production and underperform once it goes in production. 
then again, ROI will not make any sense, right? Uh, okay, you may show that uh, 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 you may show that uh, you know uh, 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 you are getting a better ROI while going production, but once it's gone in production, then uh, uh, you are not able to uh, the system is not able to be stable at that point of time. So people expect uh, there is and promised SLA uh, when they are deploying these AI solutions. Uh, fourth is auditability. So this may be required as for regulations. For example, let's say you are using it for healthcare and uh, a doctor is using as, using it as an assistive system, uh, then they would expect that, uh, uh, you know, if something goes wrong, there is a sense of auditability that they can use uh, to figure out what has actually gone wrong, right? Or to figure out uh, where things have went, uh, you know, towards not, for example. So auditability is again, another expectation from the system. And then fifth one is uh, being compliant any which ways, uh, meaning, uh, uh, you know, in, in some of these use cases, you need uh, AI to be deployed as per the regulations. Uh, then whenever you're using AI in these use cases, it has to adhere to those uh, regulations as well. So this is pretty much is a framework uh, in which uh, if you're deploying AI, you need to adhere to these kind of uh, uh, boundary conditions. Now let's look at uh, why it is required, right? Uh, so first thing is, uh, when I put an AI ML model in production, is there a, is there a scope of uh, failure, for example? Uh, there is actually very high probability that models fail more often uh, as, uh, 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 than what you realize. So people typically expect that uh, when they productionize the model, the model consistency will remain same, the accuracy will remain same, but actually in reality, uh, if you're not making changes to the model, uh, model will actually start degrading over time. Uh, yeah, so model will actually start degrading over time. So uh, so this, this is a problem with uh, AI ML model, right? Any AI ML model, when, they, when you productionize the model, uh, the model can start degrading uh, whether in short intervals or long intervals, but the model performance can drop down. So there are various reasons why the model uh, can uh, degrade. So uh, in one of the case study, uh, this is published by uh, uh, Daniel Villa, wherein they had done experimentations on more than 20,000 plus uh, model experiments. And they figured out that if they start using the model for a very long time, uh, the errors are a lot more diverse, meaning the model is making more errors if you're using the same model for a very long time. So this is being proven in more than 90, 91% of the models. So more than 91% of the models, uh, there has been a model degradation observed uh, because uh, again, uh, uh, we will go into the reasons of why the model degradation uh, will happen. But uh, this is actually a, a lot more realistic problem, uh, wherein when you productionize a model, uh, a model can degrade uh, quite quickly. Now, so we also have done an experimentation on uh, uh, underwriting data. So this is from Lending Club datasets. So this is one of the very commonly used uh, uh, datasets for building underwriting models. Uh, so this is published by Lending Club organization. Uh, it's a startup. Uh, so there, what we have done is uh, we had data from uh, 27, uh, 27 to 2020. So they published the underwriting data from 2007 to 2020. So what we have done is uh, we created five different samples of training and testing samples. Uh, one was we trained the model from 20, uh, 2007 to 2014 and tested it on remaining years. Uh, likewise, there is another model where we trained on 27 to 2015, uh, and then we tested it on remaining uh, uh, years. So we observed that, uh, you know, the higher accuracy, uh, accuracy is going up uh, when the model is more recent. Uh, again, which proves the point, right? If the model is very old, it has a lower amount of accuracy. Uh, when you are updating the model more frequently, it would have better amount of accuracy as well. So this is one experiment which can validate the same. Uh, this problem is not just there in, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in a sample scenarios. Uh, it's actually quite common uh, where when you're deploying a model, it can start drifting and you may have to do retraining or reconfigurations uh, from time to time. Now let's understand the reasons, right? Uh, why the model is uh, failing. So in this case, uh, there, are, uh, 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 there are five obvious reasons. Uh, one is it could be untrained cases. Uh, what it means is uh, this can also be uh, kind of speculated as data drift, uh, wherein I may have given uh, data of certain kind during training, but during production, I'm giving a different kind of data, which the model may not have seen in the past. 
Uh, if that's the case, then model wouldn't know what to do with it, right? Uh, it may make some obvious errors. So that's called uh, data drift. Second is called uh, concept drift or target drift, which means uh, my target itself would have been changed. For example, let's say my problem statement is an underrating problem. Uh, I may have uh, 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 I may have a definition of ideal customer, but that definition of ideal customer can change from time to time. Uh, for example, during COVID times, right? Uh, meaning you, uh, before COVID, some customer would have been an ideal customer, but same customer after COVID and after change in business policies, that customer is not an ideal customer anymore. So which means uh, the target itself might be changing, right? Uh, and then there could be an adversarial attacks. Adversarial attacks could be somebody may be sending you some wrong kind of data from time to time to uh, try to exploit the models. So these are the obvious reasons why the model uh, can, uh, 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 you know, can degrade or, or fail to perform uh, as when it goes in uh, production. So this is a neat visual representation of data drift and concept drift. So here you could see that, uh, you know, so this is my original model. So uh, original model has a target defined and training data defined. Whereas when there is a data drift, I'm suddenly receiving a different kind of data. So this could be as simple as, let's say you have a, a data point called uh, something like measurement, for example. So earlier in training data, you are capturing centimeters as the measurement, whereas suddenly in production, uh, there was some issue and you started sending, uh, uh, send, uh, instead of centimeters, you're sending meters as the measurement, right? So that is an obvious data drift. So model wouldn't know uh, that this is a meter versus a centimeter and it will start making errors uh, in those uh, areas. So the, the, the third problem, as I said, is the concept drift, wherein the goal post, which is the, uh, the target in which you train the model, uh, itself uh, could change. So again, that impacts the model as well. So these are the few reasons why the model uh, can uh, fail. And uh, in fact, just to give you a realistic uh, check, uh, this is not a hypothetical problem. Uh, this is actually very, very realistic problem. And this problem has caused enormous problems to uh, uh, users. Uh, who are who have not tracked it or tested it or uh, or done some kind of monitoring? Uh, so one of the uh, uh, few of the examples were, for example, Equifax. Uh, Equifax is well known for uh, credit scoring, right? Uh, uh, so what has happened is uh, they didn't realize that there was a data drift in the model, and uh, they started using the model predictions and started passing the model prediction predictions as the credit scores to the users. Uh, they didn't realize that model was degraded or model was failed. Uh, so they started giving more than uh, 300,000 plus wrong predictions, uh, meaning 300,000 plus uh, wrong credit scores, right? That's a massive uh, uh, impact. So this actually created a little bit of noise in the market and even caused a lot of challenges to Equifax as well. So this is an uh, example of data drift. And another example was uh, Zillow. Uh, Zillow, again, a US-based startup uh, who is well-known in uh, real estate. So one of the product that they had was using AIML uh, to predict property prices. Uh, so this is during the COVID times, again, uh, the property prices have changed drastically, right? So the ideal price, ideal property definition itself has changed, uh, which is uh, 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 which is the target drift. Uh, they didn't realize those things in the model and started betting wrongly. And uh, it caused a lot of business challenges for them as well. In fact, business continuity challenges uh, as well. So using any AI ML model is not safe uh, unless you have right monitoring metrics, unless you have right uh, monitoring uh, framework. It could cause a tremendous amount of financial losses or even reputational losses as well. Uh, so this is one case study where a model can fail because of concept drift or target drift. So the second problem that we have is uh, bias and fairness monitoring, right? Uh, so this is now required in regulation as regulations in multiple geographies. Uh, for example, in Europe, you already have AI Act, uh, wherein they, def they clearly define that for high sensitive and medium sensitive use cases, you cannot have biased uh, models. So you need to ensure that your model is not biased or favoring a certain class, uh, and you're preventing that bias before going to production. Now, typically, uh, you would track that metrics as uh, uh, during uh, 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 productionization. So before you start using it, the model, so you may do, uh, do that as a one-time activity. Uh, you will try to figure out if there is any data drift or model drift in the data and try to correct it, right? Uh, now, here is the problem. 
So this is treated as a one-time issue, which is while going production, I'll ensure that there is no data, uh, there is no bias in my uh, uh, model. But actually in reality, uh, in the same paper that I talked about earlier, uh, it was observed that uh, the bias and fairness is also influenced by temporal factors, which means that uh, in a certain time period, you may not have uh, seen bias, but in certain other time periods, you could actually see uh, bias uh, from these sensitive features. Uh, now it kind of uh, re, uh, restates your assumptions, right? Which means you have to start uh, monitoring bias and fairness uh, even in uh, production as well. Uh, so you cannot simply do it as part of the uh, training process, uh, as part of the training and production is in process and not look at it during production. So you have to start doing that even in uh, production as well. Uh, same, again, there was uh, a classic Apple underwriting uh, fiasco, right? Uh, wherein when Apple Card launched in 2019, 2020, uh, so it was observed that it was favoring males uh, with a higher credit limit. Uh, this created a lot of PR nightmare uh, at that point of time when the cards were launched. And there was even a regulator uh, review on the process uh, and on the systems as well. So bias monitoring is one of the most sensitive and very important uh, factors to keep track uh, to keep track of uh, and uh, uh, in fact it is uh, required as regulations in some of these geographies uh, so we talked about the monitoring metrics right one is uh, concept drift data drift and then bias monitoring and what about explainability so uh, this is one of the critical factors in, uh, in fact before you even uh, uh, go to uh, production for example uh, now, if you look at the model prediction, so model prediction looks something like this, right? Uh, you will have model outcome. If it is a classification model, you would have the class with a confidence score. If it is a regression model, you will have some kind of uh, score or number, and you will try to define confidence score around it. So this is not at all an acceptable outcome from the model, right? Uh, imagine this is your only uh, uh, output when you're using it for underwriting. It's not telling you anything about how the model has worked or how the model has functioned. Uh, it is only telling you this model prediction, right? Uh, 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 same thing in uh, diagnosis as well. So uh, let's say a doctor has a model assist, uh, uh, a diagnosis assistant model, and the model suggested to treat for cardiac conditions, and the model is not explaining itself and why it has to treat for cardiac condition, conditions. A doctor would be uh, taking the judgment on its own call. Uh, while he can still look at model prediction, if he doesn't or she doesn't understand how the model has functioned, uh, they may not even validate or give enough, uh, 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 you know, enough weightage to the model prediction. Uh, and explainability is required for not just the user, but all the stakeholders. For example, stakeholder is a business owner, right? Uh, let's say you are the owner of a business and you are using your model for uh, uh, underwriting or uh, diagnosis or any of these use cases. Uh, you have to have some idea on how it is functioned. Uh, you cannot have black box model, particularly for these uh, high risk use cases. Uh, and risk managers need to understand how it is functioned such that they can try to quantify the risk of the models, right? Uh, if the model is completely black box, then uh, doing the risk analysis of these models will be really, really tough. Uh, and the audit and regulators, uh, uh, again, there are regulations now to say that, you know, for a uh, uh, for a sensitive use cases and high risk use cases, you cannot use black box models. They have to be some kind of explainability uh, such that it can become explainable to even the auditors. Uh, so explainability is uh, actually something that needs to be understood by all the stakeholders. It, it is not, uh, it is not a, uh, you know, uh, it's not a privilege uh, for one class of users. So this is the biggest problem that we are seeing today. So while everybody talks about explainability, but the problem was uh, they may be doing explainability, which is understood by only few class of people, uh, not understandable or interpretable by every user in the process. So this again creates challenges. For example, in a business, you have five different kinds of stakeholders in the process. Uh, if only one of them understands the machine uh, and the four of them doesn't understand the machine, then four of four, the other four stakeholders do not have complete confidence in scaling the system. So when you're building an explainability, it has to be uh, it has to be understandable by all the stakeholders uh, in the process. Now the challenge is right. Uh, so explainability is uh, probably the basic fundamental output from any AI ML solution. But depending upon what technique that you use, it becomes quite complex to explain. Uh, so simpler models like linear models are intrinsically explainable, and then you have tree-based models which are uh, explainable uh, to some extent uh, to a certain class of audience. Uh, and then you have most complex deep learning or RL, these kind of systems, which are very, very complex to explain. 
so it gets really tough as you uh, as you start using more complex techniques uh, to explain these systems uh, now fourth challenge right which is auditing so now auditing is a very interesting scenario so let's take underrating as an example again uh, i'm going back to underrating as a case study because uh, it's a very uh, a high volume uh, high value use case uh, which is prominent uh, and well known across the industries as well hence i'm taking the underrating as a case study so typically what happens is uh, in auditing uh, uh, when when you are underwriting uh, when you are auditing an underwriting system uh, the auditing team typically has a skill set of taxation business process or regulation so this is what the skill set of an auditor today who is auditing on uh, underwriting system so this could be an uh, internal auditing external auditing or regulatory auditing right so these are the skill set and uh, from the business point of view uh, they'll involve the business uh, the business people so underwriters will be involved finance team will be involved uh, business owners will be involved when there is an auditing process now uh, imagine so if you are you are deploying an ai and ai is automating 40% of the transaction 70% of the transactions now you are uh, uh, the highest volume in your process is being processed by ai right uh, now how do you audit that system so how do you upskill uh, uh, the auditing and the internal teams so currently this is what is happening in uh, the auditing and the regulator framework where uh, the auditors are now upskilling themselves or taking the uh, input from the expert who has knowledge on model debugging model security and the data uh, security to figure out how to audit the process the revised process so the revised process is ai driven process not uh, human driven process right Uh, if if that is happening on the other end your internal team should start involving the data science teams your internal team should start involving the machine learning engineers as part of the auditing process so this is now becomes a, a very different problem as we go forward so as ai is the majority processing volume uh, you now require skill set of the models uh, ai ml models from an auditing standpoint and you need to involve these kind of uh, people uh, uh, to able to deliver that audit more effectively so this if you do not have a framework to do it at scale it becomes a very chaotic process because nobody knows how to do it properly or everybody has their own perspective of doing an audit and it becomes a huge data request where your internal uh, teams may spend enormous amount of time to simply start uh, showing or giving those uh, data points so this is where uh, uh, you know we believe ml observability can help uh, to simplify uh, the auditing process as well uh, now uh, there are challenges on uh, how uh, you do this uh, uh, internally uh, again this is a little bit technical so when we uh, we talked about explainability in the past right so for the sake of auditability uh, in, in this is happening even currently as well so what we have seen is people are using techniques like uh, sharp and line uh to deliver explainability but the problem was uh, sharp and line are not consistent uh, they are prone to uh, uh, you know scaffolding attacks uh, which means i can actually fool these explainability algorithms to hide my sensitive variable and show that i'm not using that sensitive variable uh, to uh, to a third party so there are ways that people can now uh, tweak the system it is something like you know uh, regulations required to do abc but Uh, the user may not have done that but they may full proof the system and show that you know this is what the end uh, outcome was so auditing is also not quite easy uh, you will see more complex uh, challenges uh, more new problems as we go forward now uh, there is a new problem uh, using ai ml which is models can become a source of data leakage so typically as of now uh, you know this is very less uh, educated problem uh, people thought that uh, data is the source of data leakage uh, but at, uh, or the process is the source of data leakage but models can also start leaking your uh, data so for example let's say you have sensitive data and you built models uh, using the sensitive data as is so sensitive data is you may have pii information credit card information or a bunch of uh, you know those uh, set of information now when you are using that models as is uh, by using this uh, sensitive data so there are techniques in which i can uh, actually exploit the model and get the real data from the model uh, this problem is very evident uh, in models like uh, generative ai uh, or or even synthetic ai for example so in generative ai uh, you know classic example uh, 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 chat gpt right so chat gpt is trained not only on public data but also sensitive data we may not know what exactly was the sensitive data 
but there were attacks earlier uh, when ChatGPT had launched where people able to exploit, uh, use uh, prompt attacks and jailbreak the system to get sensitive data out of the system. So in generative AI, this is the biggest problem. Uh, generative AI, if you're not done it properly, uh, it, people can start using uh, prompt attacks or uh, data uh, training data poisoning, for example. So these are the techniques that they can use uh, to exploit uh, uh, the data out of it. Uh, now, so this is a problem. So what is the solution? Solution is people may think that I'll do anonymization. I'll anonymize the data and build models on anonymized data. But again, this is this is this is not uh, a, a, a clear phone proof uh, from the model leakage attacks. Uh, so one of the examples was uh, when Netflix launched the reviews data, uh, they were able to figure out the customer's information by looking uh, by doing the uh, a similarity correlation between Amazon reviews and uh, Netflix reviews, they were able to get actual customer's information, uh, even though it is anonymized. So models is also a source of data leakage. So you have to you have to test and uh, ensure that uh, the model leakage is not, uh, models are not leaking your uh, sensitive data. Uh, so we talked about different, different scenarios, right? Now the, uh, the final problem is, are all models uh, are safe to use? meaning your team may have built a model taking six months time or one day time period because it's now, today it's quite easy to build a model. So you can build a model within a day's time. Uh, now, can I use the model uh, right away? Can I, is every model qualified to go production? Uh, maybe, may not be, but it all depends upon how you are using that uh, AI ML model. For example, if you're using that model as is without any layer of uh, protection or without any guardrails, uh, you're, you're, you're actually not uh, protecting yourself from uh, uh, you know, all these issues uh, from the models. So that's the problem when you are using outputs as is. So this is where a new layer comes in, which is called uh, policies or guard uh, guardrails or security policies. You know, the naming could be anything. It is nothing but uh, you, know, you will define the policies around your AI ML model. Uh, these, these policies would be exhaustive such that you will, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you are protecting yourself uh, from any of these uh, gaps uh, from the model. So these policies can be as simple as, uh, you know, you may, you, you may if you want to define that, I do not want a business of this sort. So whenever a model is suggesting a business of uh, a similar output, then you, uh, your policies can simply override the model. Uh, now, so this policies uh, is really important to build, but if you want to figure out what policies to be uh, defined, you will have to stress test your model, right? So then you need a, a framework or you need an approach where you can test the models, find the gaps and define policies that can build those gaps. So this becomes your exercise of uh, testing and uh, building that policies. So these policies can help you and give you the confidence that, you know, if something goes wrong at the model level, uh, the policies can override the model prediction and uh, I'm safe from, uh, you know, taking a huge financial losses. Uh, and in fact, this is actually, uh, uh, you know, quite uh, well used in uh, systems like, uh, you know, ChatGPT or LLMs, for example, today. Uh, uh, the prompts, for example, people are able to define the policies at a prompt level. Uh, this is now becoming very famous tactic on how to protect models from uh, doing wrong things or uh, protecting yourself uh, from model failures, for example. So these are the few things that, uh, uh, that um, uh, any AI ML solution has. And these are the problems that ML observability can help you resolve. Uh, one, as I said, monitoring metrics, which is uh, concept drift, data drift matrices. Uh, second is uh, bias, for example. Now you need to track the bias continuously. It's not a one-time activity anymore. Uh, and then uh, storing the artifacts and uh, preserving them uh, and able to do uh, provide an auditability much faster. Uh, and then uh, able to create policy layer and explainability, for example. So these are the various things that ML observability can help uh, uh, to resolve uh, and help the businesses to uh, protect themselves from. Uh, now, is it easy to achieve or build this ML observability framework, right? It's actually quite tough. Uh, you know, just to give you a, a reference frame, uh, you know, we are thinking of building a parallel uh, system, uh, uh, parallel to your AI ML model, right? Uh, in a way, we are saying that if AI ML is maturing at a 10x pace. Uh, you need ML observability to mature at a 100x pace. Uh, then only it can figure out and fill in all these gaps, right? Uh, it's quite a tough problem to solve, actually. And in addition to that, some of the realistic problems are uh, feedback, for example. So if you're using it for high-risk use cases, as I said, like underwriting or Medicare and all these problems, your feedback comes 
after quite a long time. So uh, it's it's a very long problem to solve for, right? Uh, and then there are a bunch of other problems like, uh, you know, uh, if uh, what happens is currently any AIML solution is uh, heavy data science driven process. Uh, as I said, uh, the process is only understood by uh, only few stakeholders. Uh, remaining stakeholders may not have full visibility, may not understand it fully. They simply uh, bet basis on uh, what data science teams are uh, saying. Uh, there is little to no business uh, uh, knowledge uh, going back to the models, uh, uh, except at the time of testing or the time of usage, which is actually a very delayed uh, uh, process of uh, building the solution. Um, now, how can we solve this problem, right? So this problem can be solved if you look at ML observability as a separate layer. Uh, so ML ops itself is a very different, very uh, uh, you know high scale problem uh, that requires a lot of focus, a lot of attention, which many people are doing today. Uh, from Data Robot or uh, Azure says make, uh, sorry, uh, uh, AWS says make it. All these players are excelled at ML ops, right? Uh, they're able to do things from A to C, uh, A to Z. Uh, now, ML observability is a layer that tags along with the ML ops, which looks at primarily model selection, uh, model monitoring, business usage and acceptance, model feedback, risk and regulatory acceptance. So this layer is what uh, the ML observability platform is designed to solve. Uh, this is actually not a new layer or a not new solution. This is quite uh, uh, well used in uh, software stack, uh, application software stack, right? Uh, so if you look at any application software stack, you would have an observability layer. Uh, very classic players like New Relic, for example, they are known for observability, software uh, observability. Uh, now, uh, models are sw swapping softwares, right? So if software already has an observability, it's quite common to expect that ML should also have uh, an observability layer. Uh, it's just that uh, it took time to uh, have a mature framework on all, but now we believe that ML observability is going to be the biggest uh, uh, differentiator. Uh, between the success of uh, AI solutions. Uh, let's quickly uh, you know, glance through what are the components that we would have, right? So they should, it should be able to deliver transparency. Uh, it should be able to help in bonded risk. It should be able to promise, uh, deliver promised SLAs and provide auditability, uh, not only between one party, but between the parties of builders and users. It should be a common platform between these two stakeholders. Uh, builders are typically, you know, data science teams, MLEs, or uh, IT teams sometimes, or engineering teams sometimes, or third-party vendors. Uh, users are primarily the business teams, right? Business teams, customers, end user, or the customer themselves. So those are the uh, end users. So it has to be a common platform that can bridge between uh, these two uh, players. Uh, so that uh, that's what Aria has built. Uh, we as an organization, we have a product called Aria XAI. Uh, which means are explainable AI. So this is an ML observability platform. So in this case, we have uh, these four components, uh, explainability, monitoring, auditing, and policy components. So let me quickly uh, give you a glance of what we have done. Uh, I know this is not uh, a place to market our product, but I'll, I'll quickly spend more time on the case study actually. So this is again a, a case study of uh, the lending, the example that I discussed earlier. Uh, in this case, we built a model uh, which can give the prediction of uh, credit scores with the confidence uh, and the output. Uh, as I said, is this good enough? Uh, is this good enough to give to an underwriter or any other uh, person in the process? No, right? Next, uh, immediately people look for uh, feature importance as an explainability. So this is a huge assumption today that if I if I'm able to build uh, and get the feature importance, uh, that can explain the model functionality. But the question is, how many people can understand this? How many people can understand the feature importance as an output? Uh, does an underwriter understand what this means? Or does an uh, auditor understand what this means to figure out how the model has functioned? The answer is no. Uh, maybe a data scientist can understand it. Maybe uh, an MLE can understand it. To some extent, engineers can understand it. But beyond that, this is not an interpretable explainability, right? So in our case, what we have done is, uh, uh, so we have looked at other ways to explain these predictions. So one of the methods we looked for is called as references as explanations. References as explanation meaning whenever the model is giving uh, an output, can I give an example where or how the model has worked in the past or how it has worked in the past so that that becomes a reference to the user. So for example, let's look at, uh, again, this conversational system as an example, right? Because this is a well understood example today. So let's say I have a question 
And in this use case, I am looking at three different uh, LLMs uh, and looking at the answers and confidence of those uh, systems. So my question was how to generate synthetic data. So one system gave me the answer along with uh, the papers or the references where it has found the answer. So this is one answer. Uh, second system was, uh, this is my question and this is the answer. There is no reference. Uh, it may have given me a very detailed answer. And third system was, uh, same answer, but it is actually searching from the internet instead of looking for the papers or anything of that sort. So it could actually find a bunch of sources and, and show me all those sources as well. So these are the different, uh, these are the three different answers, right? One with the answer with references. Second, just the answer. Third is answer with a bunch of references. Uh, when we actually asked uh, and did a quick case study uh, on uh, which one uh, they would trust more, uh, references is something that actually gives confidence to the user. It will tell the user that, uh, you know, this is where the model has learned uh, this outcome. Now I can validate the reference and figure out whether this answer is actually the most uh, uh, accurate or most up to date or not, right? Whereas when I do not have references, it's just a black box again. Uh, I don't know where it has functioned. So we picked up that uh, uh, that kind of example. Uh, and again, I'm just giving that example as a retrospect. Uh, we actually implemented this quite before uh, the chat GPT examples. So in this case, what we have done is uh, the models are actually learning from the training data, from the historical training data. So what we thought is whenever the model is giving the prediction, why don't we show those cases where the model would have learned this prediction from the past? Uh, so whenever a model is giving the prediction, it will tell you that these are the past similar cases where the model would have learned this prediction. Now it gives a lot of evidence uh, to the user, right? Saying that, okay, the model would have learned from these policies and this is the outcome. And if something is wrong in the model prediction, they can validate the labels uh, saying that, okay, is there any labeling error? Or if there is a conflict with the model prediction, the user can refer to the past examples and figure out what the past historical evidences have done. So this is proven to be really important, particularly in uh, risk monitoring cases uh, like fraud detection or underwriting, for example, uh, or anomaly detection. In these kind of use cases, uh, having those references where you have successfully uh, validated those examples in the past uh, can actually give a very quick directional input to the user. So references as examples is proven to be really uh, important and really powerful explanation for uh, explainability. So that is second type of explainability. So while we are giving the model prediction, uh, we have started giving the feature importance such that they can understand that which feature has the most importance in which direction, positive and negative direction. And uh, third, we have done references as explanations so that they know that you know this is a historical training data which has uh, resulted in this uh, model prediction. Uh, even after doing these things, there was still some hesitation uh, on, uh, okay, so what else can you do to give confidence to the user? So let's say this is a very sensitive use case. I'm using AI for the first time, or uh, my users don't know how the AI has worked. How can we give confidence to the users? Uh, so let's take a step back and understand how an expert works in this case. An expert is, let's say, an underwriter or a doctor or a fraud investigator, right? Uh, how do they function in their job? So whenever you ask, for example, a doctor, uh, how do you uh, suggest a diagnosis? Uh, they would have a principles, right? They would have their own uh, job principle or a decisioning principle. So principles is I look for point A first and then point B and then point C. Uh, for me to recommend, uh, 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 let's say a chemotherapy or uh, a cardiac condition uh, diagnosis, uh, I'll look for these three key reasons uh, to help me validate whether I should go forward or not. So there would be uh, principles of uh, functioning uh, in all these expert functions. Pretty much all white collar functions have uh, these uh, uh, principle guidelines, right? Now, what we said is, uh, why don't we list out all these principle guidelines and compare what is the rank of the principle guidelines for a case uh, between an expert versus the model? So to do that, what we have done is uh, we collected the principles for a given function. For example, underwriting uh, as a use case, uh, we collected all the principles on, on which they will accept the case, they'll reject the case, they'll increase the premium or they'll go for uh, investigation, for example. So we asked them to list out all the different guidelines. Uh, it can be as exhaustive as they want to, or it can be very specific as they want. To. So for example, uh, there could be a guideline, something like this. 
if there is any public bankruptcies and low FICO score is not preferred to an underwriter. So one underwriter said that uh, if there is any pu public bankruptcies, meaning publicly disclosed bankruptcy, bankruptcies, and the FICO score is again not good, meaning that profile is very, very risky for me, I would probably reject that or maybe uh, do that as a very, very high interest rate. So this is one principle from the user. Then what we have done is we identified what are the different data points uh, that are there in the training data uh, that can be uh, used to build this principle. So we then mapped uh, the different features that we have uh, to this uh, 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 to this principle. So ideally, if you have done your feature importance very accurately uh, and uh, very uh, uh, optimally, uh, your feature importance is you know what are the feature map uh, for uh, uh, for the decisioning, right? Uh, when uh, when you combine the feature importance of all these features, as uh, depending upon the explainability method, uh, most of them are additive in nature. Meaning, if I combine this, that will give me the total importance score of the combination of these features. So uh, we started linking uh, a principle with the features. Uh, the feature importance score for that case will anyways be calculated by the explainability model. Uh, we then aggregated and created a feature score uh, for this principle. So whenever uh, the model is predicting uh, here on the extreme right side, I know it's small in size, uh, but it, it is something like this. Uh, there is a principle one uh, and there is a, a feature score uh, for this principle one. Uh, feature uh, uh, principle two, feature score for principle two. And these are ranked in the order of importance. So higher importance will be on the top uh, feature. Uh, lower importance will be on the bottom of the uh, principle uh, list. So uh, now for this case, whenever an underwriter sees uh, this uh, textual output, they may say that, oh, okay, I'll probably look at in the same order of uh, priority. Uh, I'll probably look at in the same order of importance as well. So this looks very similar to me. Uh, as I said, for example, let's say, you know, the frequency of chest pain is very high. If that principle has high importance and doctor also tells that that is my top uh, uh, important principle and there is a, a coherence between uh, the model uh, functioning and the expert function. So this is another way of giving confidence to the user. Uh, again, we are not saying this is accurate, but this is uh, one way to explain the model functioning. Uh, the uh, important caveat is what are you using to derive this feature importance? Uh, as I said, if you're using sharp or line, it may not be accurate uh, because uh, uh, you know, depending on the perturbations, number of perturbations, you would have different kind of explainability. Uh, but if you're using true to model explainability, some of these will actually have a correlation with the realistic uh, user as well. So all in all, this is what we combined as an explainability report, uh, which is part of our ML observability framework. So in addition to the prediction, they'll get all of this as an explainability in real time, says that any user, not just the data science teams, but an underwriter or a business team or an auditor, all of them can understand uh, how the model has functioned for this case. So that is on the explainability side. And then on monitoring side, uh, we have an ML, ML monitoring framework. Uh, in fact, in this case, uh, we actually use different metrics, not just one metrics, uh, to find data drift because uh, sometimes it is observed that uh, some of these metrics works more accurately than the other metric, depending on the data and depending on the model uh, that you have built. So it's ideal to test multiple data metrics before we before you finalize saying that you know I'll use PSI or I'll use JET, uh, JET test or KS test for example uh, for your uh, data drift monitoring. Uh, same thing for target drift monitoring as well. Uh, we validated multiple matrices before we figured out what metrics can I use for this problem statement. So now, whenever there is a data drift or model drift observed, I'll get an alert uh, such that I can correct it even before the model uh, is degrading beyond uh, control. Um, and then for uh, bias monitoring, we use uh, a bunch of these matrices as a combination to figure out if there is any bias in the data. Uh, so far, we talked about matrices and explainability, right? Uh, now, uh, we have to build the policy layer, uh, policy layer around this model. As I said, uh, you know, what are these guardrails uh, that you can define around the model such that uh, model is uh, not giving you a wrong uh, outcomes or you are able to control the model failures, for example. So to build these guardrails, there are two things that I have to understand. One, uh, to understand model and, model and data specific guardrails. Second is process specific guardrails. So model and data specific guardrails was uh, once I train the model, I'll try to figure out what are the segments where my model performance is not up to the mouth. Uh, how do I, uh, you know, control these, uh, 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 control these errors, for example. 
So I, I, I can define a segmenting algorithm like rule fit, for example, and identify multiple buckets where I'm getting very high false positive rates or high false negative rates. Let's say these are two matrices uh, that I'm tracking. So using that, I can actually build a bunch of policies around the model. For example, it could be as simple as uh, for a model confidence less than uh, 90%, your false positive rates is going up by 45%, for example. So this is, this is just a simple outcome, right? Uh, you can find out the segment where you are getting this. Let's say in this case, it's simply model confidence uh, and you can define a threshold for the model confidence. Uh, but in reality, you have to combine that with multiple other metrics, uh, data plus model confidence to be able to figure out what kind of policies that can work for you. And then there could be process specific, right? Process specific is as a business, uh, you, uh, you can simply say that I cannot accept uh, a, uh, an applicant whose FICO score is less than 500. Let's say that is your business uh, uh, policy. So you can define those policies as part of the policy uh, guidelines. Uh, you can define multiple of those policies. Let's say you cannot underwrite uh, a customer from tier four. You can define that as a policy. A model may have uh, predicted and uh, uh, predicted and uh, accept outcome for those scenarios, but the policies can override that. So I can use all of that. And then uh, REIXA has a simple uh, GUI, uh, GUI uh, to define these policies very quickly and uh, define the target. Uh, so target that they want to modify uh, and the user can maintain these policies by themselves. So this is, uh, uh, this is where the business teams involved hands-on. Uh, you know, they have complete control on these policies while the data science teams prepare the models, uh, the business teams uh, define the guidelines, uh, gets the outcomes from the data science teams, uh, uh, understand the risks and define more and more guidelines required for that process. Uh, all in all, combination of this is what proven to be really effective uh, for us uh, when we deployed ML observability uh, and define the AI governance. Uh, where we define these components and we define the ownership of these components, like uh, monitoring ownership is uh, data science teams, uh, explainability ownership is both data science teams and the business, model risk, both data science teams and the business. Uh, so uh, ML Observability can able to give you those components and define the ownership so that you can uh, define the policies uh, and say, you know, these are the uh, internal uh, governance policies or uh, model usage policies that you would want to apply uh, on top of the model. So this is a quick example on how uh, we were able to deliver that in, uh, in one of the examples, which was uh, the lending case study. Um, and quickly, we are, uh, we are actually uh, able to release uh, a DIY version as well. Uh, so this is a quick interface overview. Uh, I can quickly show some of these outputs as well. So this is a lending club data. Um, so here you could see what are the different uh, uh, data that I have been using in my data. You can also find the data descriptions as well. Um, now, let me show a quick example of ML explainability. So this is my live cases. Uh, this is where I define these observations. Hello, uh, guys, am I audible? Yes. Sorry. Yeah, uh, there was a net network prop. Uh, but anyways, uh, you could see that the, you know there are a bunch of policies. Now, if I go and look any case, for example, this is one of uh, one case that I ping through an API. Uh, here, you could see all the details that I talked about as part of our explainability, uh, which is feature importance, observations, uh, and uh, the other set of information as well. So let's give a second uh, until it loads. So you could see raw data, similar cases. As I said, the similar cases was, uh, uh, you know, giving the references as example. So here, this is my model prediction. And uh, these are my uh, uh, feature importance scores. Uh, and these are the observations that I was able to define. And you could see, uh, you know, the observation for this and the score for this is this. Uh, in this case, I was able to define policies as well, uh, my risk policies. What has happened was uh, there was a policy that I defined saying that you know model confidence in this score is 0.81, which is uh, my threshold was 90%. So uh, it was actually more from accept to manual. So which means this case goes for manual now. So this is one example where you could see how the policies and uh, you know uh, uh, the observations and explainability can be implemented. And uh, monitoring, I'll quickly show this and then uh, take the questions now. So whenever I'm uh, doing monitoring, as I said, I can use any of these metrics and define the threshold that I want. Uh, you could see the monitoring uh, that I've done. Uh, 
So you could see the distribution of the data between uh, two samples, which is base and your current. Baseline is you can define any baseline, and current is probably your production uh, data as your uh, current. So you could do target uh, targeted mounting, bias mounting, model performance, and then uh, alerts as well. Uh, all in all, uh, you know this is uh, as I said. Uh, uh, you know there are many things that can go wrong with the model. Uh, ML observability is that layer that is now gaining a lot of importance uh, because regulations are now becoming very clear on uh, what you can use and what you cannot use. Uh, so uh, having a scalable ML, ob ML observability can deliver uh, can help you to design uh, a governance framework. Um, uh, today, it's quite important to have self-governance. Uh, forget about you know adhering to regulations which come after some time, but you have to ensure that uh, you are safe from model failures, you are safe from model-related risks, uh, and uh, you are able to use AI to its full potential. Uh, so for all that problems, we believe a good ML observability is the answer. Uh, it can help you to do better governance, uh, better model monitoring, uh, better uh, model, ac model acceptance, and able to get better ROI from, uh, from the solution itself. Uh, given that you would spend a lot of time in building these models, uh, you would, uh, you know, having these frameworks can actually expedite many of these uh, steps. Uh, so that's it. Uh, so that's pretty much closes, uh, uh, you know, the today's conversation. Um, happy to take uh, any questions that you have, guys. Yeah, I think some of you have already raised the questions in the chat. Uh, let me go through them. Hmm. Okay. I think somebody commented that I'm speaking too fast. My apologies. I hope uh, you could able to get what I'm saying. Uh, but this is recorded anyway, so you know, feel free to go through that uh, once again if you're not able to understand what I said. Uh, next is uh, it could also be in a inadequate training set to start our unconscious bias from coders. That's true. Uh, I think one of the very common reasons why model fails is lack of training data or not able to pick the right training data. Um, it, it's, it's actually not, uh, you know, uh, somebody will say that I'll just take the dump of last 10 years and retrain the model on that. Um, it may not be ideal to retrain on last 10 years of data. Maybe it's ideal to retrain on uh, only last three years of data uh, because there could be a lot of bias, there could be a lot of uh, gap data before that, right? Uh, you never know. Uh, there could be a rule of thumb saying that more data is better for the model, but uh, the rule of thumb is very, uh, you know, very rudimentary rule of thumb. So you have to add more layers before uh, you could able to mitigate around this. Uh, next, a question on data drift. Shouldn't there be an alert system that tells ML engineer when the data drift becomes too big? Yes, that's what a uh, monitoring system should do. Uh, monitoring system should tell the user when the model is uh, uh, you know, uh, going off, uh, off the chart ahead of the time. So for example, data drift, uh, immediate data drift may not result in immediate data performance uh, uh, loss. There could be a gap, uh, but again, this all depends on uh, uh, use case and the model. So you would have some time to correct this. Uh, if you have a quite good uh, recurring systems or uh, replaceable systems, uh, you could actually correct data drift very easily and prevent from model performance uh, degradation or heavy model performance degradation. So uh, ideally, uh, 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 all, uh, all the MLEs, data science teams should use some kind of monitoring system in production uh, which is a bare minimum requirement uh, to track model. Uh, all the other components that I talked about, model safety, model risk, model explainability are a little bit advanced. And the very basic thing is you should use something to monitor it. Uh, that's that's very much is expected. Um, next is, should it, should it already be an SOP to retain the models periodically? We do this for our models. Um, in fact, yes, uh, you should retain the models. Now there is uh, there is a bet better way of doing this. There is uh, a, a, a simple way of doing that. Uh, all retraining may not improve your model performance. Um, in fact, let me show the example that I said in the lending club data. That was quite interesting actually. So if you look at the model performance, uh, so this is retraining, right? So I'm initially I'm using very old data, using it for all the upcoming years. Uh, whereas in this case, I'm using seven, uh, 2007 to 2015 data. In this case, I'm using 2007 to 17 data. But here, there is a dip of uh, accuracy, right? Uh, why is this happened? Uh, this could be happened because of labeling error. Uh, this could be happened because of data drafts, uh, sorry, model draft, which was not configured in the past. So what we are seeing is um, 
take as your retraining data can actually influence your model performance as well. Uh, doing it uh, on 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 a, on a recurring basis is definitely safe to do, uh, but you could actually improve further and get better accuracies from the model as well. Um, okay, one question was: uh, Does model retraining due to data drift, for example, ever require change to underlying mathematics used in the model? It could be. Uh, let's take a data point. Um, I'm not able to quite get what exactly what is the data point. Maybe something like, ah, uh, yeah, let's take something like uh, uh, textual data point. Let's say earlier you only had a fixed number of categories where you were using that as a categorical feature, but now you suddenly started getting uh, uh, actual textual inputs. Uh, it could be something like remarks, for example. We have seen that problem in remarks. Uh, so what happened was historically people were capturing remarks as a simple class, uh, like, uh, you know, rejected because of insufficient data or something like that, four or five different classes. Uh, but while that is good, but you could actually improve when you have a, a free flow, com uh, free flow comments, right? Uh, when the data type has changed drastically, then you cannot continue to consider that as a categorical data, meaning your model itself might also have to change because the data has changed quite uh, uh, drastically, uh, the same model, the same model features, the same hyperparameters may not be uh, relevant anymore. So then you have to change your model itself. So there could be an example where because of the data drift, you should be able to change uh, the model itself. Um, are there alternatives to line or sharp that are resistant to exploit? Uh, yes. Um, so typically what happens is, uh, you know, if you look at many commercial offerings today, uh, some of them are uh, uh, expert, uh, some of them are building uh, model specific or technique specific kind of explainability, uh, which can actually bridge the gaps of sharp and type. Uh, for example, Fiddler has something. Uh, if you look at ARIA itself, so we have our own method called backtrace, uh, which is an explainable method for deep learning because we use heavy deep learning models. Uh, when we experimented with sharp and line, so we were not fully satisfied. So we, uh, we have built our own uh, explainability method. So the trend that we have seen is, you know, some of these commercial players have a unique technique, which is, uh, which can fill in the gaps of uh, the, uh, the, the typical Lyman shop. Uh, and that's how they are getting differentiated. That's how we are getting differentiated as well. Meaning we are able to do true to model uh, explainability, particularly when it comes to deep learning, for example. So you could actually find an alternatives um, in the open source community, uh, which could be model specific, technique specific or data specific sometimes. Uh, and use those uh, explainability methods. Uh, sharp online, you may use that as a one-on-one -on -one approach uh, for uh, low risk use cases, simpler problems, but I would definitely recommend to explore more than sharp online uh, for explainability. Yeah, um, any other questions, guys? Um, a quick note here, I think I've, I've kind of skipped it quite fastly there. Yes. So uh, the other way to use ML models instead of using anonymized data is synthetic AI. So this is now becoming a new, newly explored uh, area where what people are now saying is, uh, why can't I build a synthetic AI models uh, that can use the sensitive data and create uh, accurate true to, uh, true to reality uh, uh, kind of transformations uh, using GANs or using variable autoencoders or those kind of methods and build models uh, using those synthetic data sets. Um, so this actually can solve the problem of data leakage, particularly if you're using uh, generative AI or synthetic AI kind of models. Uh, instead of using real data, uh, maybe you can experiment with synthetic data using synthetic AI techniques uh, and then use the data to build models. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, we have a component called uh, AXAI synthetics. Uh, we, when we experimented on, uh, we were able to build uh, synthetic data which has a very similar model performance as compared to real data, which means you could actually replace your entire synthetic data, and, sorry, real data and use synthetic data only. Uh, or simply you can use synthetic data to improve your models as well. So, you know, wherever you find bias, use synthetic data to augment the bias. Uh, so synthetic synthetic AI is now becoming a very important component for ML, uh, ML explainability. If you have not explored it, you know, uh, feel, uh, uh, I would recommend you sincerely to explore that. Uh, so it's it's 
quite a, a fab uh, at this point of time as well because generative AI is nothing uh, but is an alternative to synthetic AI. Um, generative uh, AI creates new samples uh, using text and images. Uh, synthetic AI uh, creates realistic samples uh, from images or uh, tabular data sets and all. So it's a very uh, uh, interesting problem uh, if you have challenges with uh, your models. Thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure uh, hearing you lecture. Very well uh, presented and very well understood. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Omit, for uh, giving us the opportunity and thanks for the community as well.